ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان خير الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار it took me 10 months to collect this book by the help and aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so i don't know how i can you know finish this lecture today in one hour so let's head directly to the topic alaykum assalam page 75 here talks about an interesting notion that many muslims these days keep repeating that is muhammad ibn abdul wahab rahimahullah being a secret agent of the british government he definitely wasn't a secret agent or a public agent let's talk about some dates he was born in 1115 hijriya which is 1703 and died in 1206 hijriya which is 1792 between that muhammad ibn abdul wahab spent a good number of years in the beginning of his life seeking islamic knowledge so here we say about this the following ibn abdul wahab and the british council in basra and uh, under that early wahhabi movement and ties to european powers first muhammad ibn abdul wahhab in basra muhammad ibn abdul wahhab rahimahullah <coughs> left basra <coughs> at uh, an early time before he started his da'wah in arabia so by the time he went to basra he was seeking knowledge he met some shuyukh of knowledge to learn with them hadith and other aspects of the religion wasn't a leader of a tribe or an amir of any province he wasn't a rich man famous man a known man at all so for uh, the british council in basra to want to meet him and make a pact with him uh, was ridiculous uh, <coughs> authentic historical reports said that sheikh abdul wahab died in Huraymila Najd in 1153 that's the uh, father of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab years before that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab had moved back to Huraymila which is his hometown so from this date 1153 and before that a few years before that Ibn Abdul Wahhab returned to Najd <coughs> never left Arabia after that so now we have a few dates date of birth date of death and he returned from Basra to Huraymila after that his father died in 1153 which is 1740 and he was there for years before his father died <clears throat> it should be noted that the british military involvement in the arabian gulf started in the 19th century which is 1800 uh, ibn abdul wahab died in the 17th century but in the beginning it was involved in just uh, commercial aspects it wasn't there as a major military power so it had no real presence in the arabian gulf by the time the british consulate was recognized in basra it was 1767 so from let's say even if he went back to huraymila just days before his father died in 1153 which is 1740 the first the first british council who was approved by the uthmani khilafa during that time came in 1767 what's the difference here let's talk 27 years how did he meet him then <laughs> where because that british council in basra never came to arabia and he came to basra 27 years at least after ibn abdul wahab left it how did they meet we have to rule out i think safely faxes the internet uh, the british uh, 
postal service in the evening and the day, and any other means of him meeting him, because why would he even want to meet him? He wasn't a known person in any way or form. So, 1740 he left Basra, 1767 the first British Council came, after 1740 he never went back or left uh, Arabia, how did he meet the British Council? Uh, it's a fabrication, unsupported by a shred of evidence. That's why I want to tell you brothers, make it easy. When they tell you he was a British uh, agent, he met the British Council, whatever, prove it. Give us some kind of history to prove it. Not a desire. Uh, let me say a few words here, and I don't know how I can finish in one hour, but anyway, we'll try inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which nation slanders its own leaders? Which nation slanders its own leaders and reformers? This only happens by the, by the hands of the Jews. When they were tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they failed in the test, and many of them became idol worshippers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them trouble, and they were captured and moved to Iraq for 70 years before they were allowed to go back to Palestine. During that time, they were very miserable, and they hated their own selves. So they changed the book of Allah with their own hands, and changed the seer of their prophets, made them to look like murderers, zina, people, people who have no moral standard of any way or, any st or of any level. And then they trashed their own history, their own people, their own leaders. But in our nation, it's the opposite, it should be. Imam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, if you ask the Jews who are the best among you, they will say the companions of Musa alayhi salam. If you ask the Christians, who are the best members of your ummah, they will say the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. If you ask the Rafidah, who are the worst of your ummah, they will say the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The worst. We shouldn't fall into that trap because those who claim or make these claims are the enemies of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. There was no reason for him to meet any British council because Arabia was outside the sphere of influence of the British Empire and even the Khilafah. And this is something maybe you'd want to ask me about later. But Arabia, especially Najd area, was not under direct control of the Khilafah for a long time before Ibn Abdul Wahhab was born. <clears throat> and I would imagine maybe, so what would have happened in the meeting between Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab and the British Council? What's the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab? Simply, to resurrect Tawheed in the area where Tawheed started flowing from there to all over the world. During his time, when he started growing up, he noticed many, many things. The people went back to the ways of shirk that Rasulullah came back to destroy. They stopped praying and zakah, and what is worse, they had superstitious, superstitious ideas. So they started going around graves, invoking the dead, <coughs> revering trees and stones. The shirk that Rasulullah came to destroy it. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, at an early age, started learning the knowledge of Islam by scholars of Sunnah and Hadith in his time, who emphasized to him the value of Tawheed and how we should bring it back to the life of the Muslims. Also, Arabia was divided into many, many, many tribes and uh, Emirat, which is a leadership of small pieces of land fighting with each other all the time. Those who were uh, happy to go to Hajj expected not to go back home alive. Because on the way, many tribes will attack them, take their money, and it wasn't safe for them. So Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, what was his mission? to bring back Tawheed and the practices of the Sunnah in the life of the Ummah. Now, the British Empire, as a defender of Christianity and the commercial benefits of Europe, especially Britain, what need would they have for this man? So, I, maybe I would imagine just a conversation that went between them, had they met. They never met, of course. So the British Council would say to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, we're angry because the Arabs are divided, they're weak, <laughs> they went back to shirk, they don't practice the religion, 
didn't do salah or siyam or zakah, we would like you to go as our secret agent to take them back to Tawheed and to the salah and siyam and zakah. And we say, okay, I'll do that. For no money, of course, exchanged because there is no historical proof that he received money from anyone other than Muhammad ibn Saud rahimahullah. Also, no weapons involved because during that time, uh, you know, the traditional weapons were available anyway. Do you think that conversation ever happened? So between a reformer who wants to bring back Tawheed and an empire that took upon itself to fight the Muslims again after they led one of the last crusades, especially the one that made Salah al-Din, that's the British Empire. They want to bring back, uh, I mean, they want to emphasize Christianity and they know that the biggest competitor for their religion is Islam and that the Muslims are asleep and they wanted to use the chance to keep them that way. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there is no way that the British Empire would have contacted Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab because what he did afterwards is emphasizing Tawheed and the principles of Islam and faith and practice. This contradicts the mission and goal of all Christian powers, especially the British Empire. So it couldn't have happened. But uh, it's a shame that so many Sunnis, because they don't read their own history, they come and tarnish the image of this Imam of Sunnah and repeat what the Kuffar say about him and repeat what those who are deviant sects say about him. And therefore, he was one of our Imams. You should look into that very seriously and not accept any of these rumors. So again, he was born 1115 Hijriya, which is 1703, died 1206, which is 1792, 1740, he left Basra and joined his father who died a few years after that in Huraymila, which is their hometown. And the first British council to arrive at Basra came in 1767, 27 years after he left Basra. <coughs> so Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab never had the opportunity to meet that British council. And I don't think he would even think about it in any way or form. Because in the Arabian Gulf, the British presence was very minimal. And it was only mainly to protect their commercial interest. Uh, maybe I should stop now for maybe if you have any uh, comment on what I just said. If there is any other, you know, uh, uh, comment or maybe a doubt you had, inshallah ta'ala, let me know before I go forward. Inshallah. Is there any questions? So we're okay, okay with that. Question. Yes. Can I ask now? Or if yes, go ahead, inshallah. Yeah, they're saying that in the time of uh, Imam Muhammad bin Wahhab, there was a lot of killing. So he, he imposed Wahhabism to. Uh, uh, he killed so many people to impose Wahhabism. The uh, there were wars, yes, between the Islamic State that he started with Muhammad ibn Saud and those who opposed it. But a lot of killing, that's not true. Inshallah, let's address this later on. About the topic of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the uh, European powers, especially the British. Because we hear these days, many times, people say he was a British spy. A British spy couldn't have a mission of bringing back Tawheed. A British spy would be doing the opposite. And we know that in European countries, even today, uh, if somebody comes with a deviant idea, practices, those governments support them. In America, for example, I reside in America now, uh, between America and Jordan. Uh, for years now, they're bringing you know, the name of some shuyukh. Uh, Sheikh doesn't mean a scholar. It might, you know, because uh, Iblis is Shaykh al <laughs> that's what he's called. But this, uh, uh, a man who's deviant, really, in a big way, but he's portrayed in the American media as the first genuine American imam or scholar. You know, because he was born there, but what he teaches is something that's drastically different from what Rasulullah came with. Uh, they give him support, they give him media coverage, and uh, so those Western powers, they will never support an Islamic state that calls to Tawheed. The next question, sorry, I have to say. Did he start a new sect? 
Okay, this is page 600. Let's go to that. I can't talk more about him being a spy because the dates are clear. Unless somebody comes with a, a contract between Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and the British Council where he promises to bring back Tawheed to Arabia and they promise to give him nothing for that. Uh, other than that, there is no historical evidence that he ever met any British or any European power representative or had anything to do with them. But in Allah Azza wa Jal, when we talk about the sex now, uh, about him inventing a new madhab, school of thought. Now, by that time, it's obvious that many uh, or most of the Muslim nation was divided into the four traditional schools of fiqh. And they inherited this generation after generation until they thought that this is the truth and the only way to practice the religion. And therefore, if someone comes with something outside of these four madhahib, then he must be doing a bid'ah, inventing a new sect or a new madhab. <clears throat> now, we have to understand, like, here's a, a, a person, his name Minhaj Harun, said that the Uthmani state instructed some of its scholars to falsely ascribe statements to Ibn Abdul Wahhab that were supported by, uh, unsupported by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to make people think that he came with a fifth madhab. A fifth madhab to the people there, ah, oh, what's going on? This is a bid'ah. This is a sunnah, just four madhab. To be five, to make it witter, doesn't happen. It has to be four. Three doesn't work, four. But Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, as we know from the scholars that he learned with, including his own father, who was a major scholar of the Hanbali madhab in Huraymila, and then Dar'iyya, the Imam learned and practice the Hanbali Madhab. And he didn't invent a new Madhab at all because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, gave him the wisdom not to make it too obvious or too much for him and his followers. They contradicted the people in Tawheed. And with regards to the Madhab, he didn't really emphasize, you know, the Madhab that we should or shouldn't follow them or whatever. Why? Because he wanted to make things easy for his people. You know, look what they did to him and how they fought him and his people and slandered him until today for bringing back Tawheed. What if he added to that, telling them, let's follow the Quran and Sunnah with the Sahaba and use the Madahib only to benefit from some of their rulings. But Imam Abdul Wahhab was a renowned scholar of the Hanbali Madhab. And uh, we have to understand here that With regards to the Madahib, uh, here we have Dr. Twaim. He said, many uh, sign, uh, Orientalists hold the view that the mission of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was a purifying reformist mission dedicated to return the people to the methodology of the way of the Salaf al-Salih. So even the Orientalists during that time understood his mission to be about returning to the way of the Salaf al-Salih. Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wrote books on the Hanbali Madhab, and he also gave fatawa according to the Hanbali Madhab. He emphasized in you know some of his speeches that we follow the Madhab and we encourage everyone to follow the Madhab. And even his son Abdullah, Muhammad, the son of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who was a major scholar himself, wrote that from the Sunnis we only accept from them that they should follow one of the four Madhab. Uh, he was wise in doing that because, you know, the sectarian strife between Muslims then was very big. And therefore, they wanted to control at least the differences between Muslims into what happened between the four madhahib. So Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was a scholar of the Hanbali madhahib. Uh, some of the books that we translated for him are clearly on the lines of the Hanbali madhahib. And he never said in any way or form that don't follow these madhahib, desert them. Uh, what we want to say that the Uthmani Khilafah by that time, by the way, did what the uh, Uthmani, the Abbasi Khilafah. During the time of the Abbasi Khilafah, they almost forced the state to become a Hanafi in Madhab. And therefore, the Mufti of the Khilafah during the time of the Uthmanis was a Hanafi. And the scholars were mainly Hanafi. Those who received support from the state were Hanafi. But they tolerated the other three Madhab. 
And therefore, when they come and say that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab said that we should abandon those four madahib, uh, and you read the books that he wrote, you'll find the difference between the slander and the reality. Because they emphasize the fact that the four Imams were Imams of Sunnah, and therefore they didn't object to people following one of the madahib to the extent that Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wrote in one of his letters saying, from the Sunnis, we only expect them or accept from them to follow one of the four madahib. Now about the madahib, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, of course, uh, what, what he did is that, what the Imams before, uh, before him did. When there is a ruling that is not supported from the uh, or a fiqh issue from the Hanbali madhab that doesn't, that's not supported by the Quran and Sunnah or by Hadith, he would follow the Hadith. But he would, you know, follow mainly the principles of the Hanbali madhab in many ways and many of its fatawa. Until today, you see the scholars of the area that people call to Saudi Arabia, until today, the scholars mainly follow the Hanbali madhab and the fiqh. That's what you see in their writings and their fatawa. Uh, why would they do that? I mean, here let's talk about the connection between Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah and his madhab and the Salafi way that we emphasize these days. Among the four Imams, Imam Ahmad has the mo had the most knowledge in the Sunnah. It is reported that among all the scholars of Islam, he memorized more than two million narrations. And no scholar before or after was mentioned to memorize as many ahadith as he did. Bukhari memorized 600,000 according to Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. So Imam Ahmad was a, a supercomputer, if you want to call him that way, where he collected two million narrations. That doesn't mean there are two million different ahadith. Many of those ahadith are repeated, statements from the Sahaba, weak ahadith, uh, inserted, uh, added, added ahadith, fabricated ahadith. But he memorized two million narrations, Imam Ahmed. And this is why the scholars called him Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The stance he took with, rega with regard to the Aqeedah, when the fitna started by al Ma'moon, that required the scholars to agree with his invented idea that he took from the Mu'tazila, that the Qur'an was one of the creations of Allah, it was a created being or something. Imam Ahmad rejected that, and because of that he was sent to jail, flogged, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated him in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of that stance. So the Salafis of today, you might find that so many scholars among the Salafi uh, movement want to follow many of the things that Imam Ahmad said because his madhab was founded more than the other three Imams on the ahadith. It's natural because this is, he memorized two million ahadith. And you can, can you imagine that uh, Imam Bukhari, when he came to Baghdad, the scholars of Baghdad heard about him and about his, uh, you know, memory power. Imam, one of the Imams of Islam was saying that when we met Al-Bukhari and Another scholar of hadith, his name is al Duhali, wanted to discuss some hadith with Bukhari. He would mention the hadith, the hadith of Bukhari, and Bukhari would fly with it. So quickly, giving him the narrations and the chains and everything, like he was flying, flying, you know, this is how fast he was in recalling those hadith. So Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was a major scholar of hadith, and as I said, you know, two million narrations. So there is a great connection between the Salafi movement and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But we don't call to strict following of the madahib, but that we should learn, inshallah ta'ala, from the madahib through them and always go back to the sunnah so that we can, bi'idhnillah azza wa jal, you know, take the benefit from them and then follow uh, the sunnah whenever there are instances where there are fatawa that are clearly unsupported by the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when the Uthmani empire or state instructed some of the scholars uh, to say that Ibn Abdul Wahhab brought uh, a new madhab. It was a justification for them to discount him, make the people think ill of him, and reject his message. Uh, this is similar to calling their, uh, the, the movement Wahhabi movement. There is no such thing as Wahhabi movement. Insha'Allah Azza wa Jal, I want you to remember this. First of all, his name is Muhammad son of Abdul Wahhab, so his father is Abdul Wahhab. 
the people who wanted to defy his message and reject him and slander him, uh, if they call him, if they call the movement Muhammadi movement, people would think, oh, mashallah, so he's uh, connected to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they thought that to escape from that, let's call him Wahhabi. Who is Al-Wahhab? Allah. So they, <laughs> they escaped from calling him after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They called him after the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the failure here on their part in two ways. They wanted to defame him, but they ascribed his method or group or reformist movement to Al-Wahhab alayhi subhanahu wa ta'ala, escaping from calling him Muhammadi after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who called that group Wahhabi? Again, it's the British. The first person who actually mentioned the word Wahhabi, and we have a recorded, you know, uh, a record of that, is a captain, British captain called Sadler. And he sent to Ibrahim Pasha, who was instrumental in destroying the first Saudi state, telling him, uh, congratulating him for destroying the Wahhabi state. So among all the records we, say, we find a British soldier who gave that name to the movement to uh, Ibrahim Pasha, the son of Ali Pasha, Ali, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha. Now we have to remember something brothers, during that time Egypt was almost completely under French influence and Muhammad Ali actually allowed the French Navy to for the first time you know, go into the Red Sea. So the first ruler who allowed the French to be in the Red Sea was Muhammad Ali. And he's the one who got instructions from the Khilafah al Uthmaniyya, which was very weak, to go into Arabia and destroy the Wahhabi movement by calling them deviants, those who brought another sect, and then the other jokes that we hear that they met with the British Council or whatever it is. But when Ali Basha went into Arabia, he found resistance there, and he was defeated actually many times until he, you know, destroyed the Wahhabi state uh, according to them. So the British were happy for the destruction of the state, and they gave a letter of congratulation to the Amir or leader who destroyed it. So again, how can this prove in any way that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was connected to the British Empire? Now, I didn't want to spend too much time on these things because we have to go back to talking insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the mission of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and insha'Allah ta'ala uh, going to page 673 here uh, I'm not sure if you have the book if you can turn to that otherwise insha'Allah maybe later on we'll get the book and then remember these pages That's, uh, this is the mission of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab he called to the pure tawheed that Allah sent down to his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and warned against shirk its methods and against bid'ah, fallacies, fanaticism, and superstition. From shirk, we get that information uh, that the Arab, Arab people during that time, they got, went back to the ways of shirk. They started worshiping graves, the dead, trees, and it was so bad that, uh, let me give you two examples. One of them, they would go again and put t ropes around or uh, on trees, for uh, invoking the tree for help and support, just like the people did before. And women who didn't have children, they would uh, be given the instruction, there is a blessed tree there and a branch of it, go have sex with that branch and you will have a child. And they used to do that, it was popular among them. So when an Imam of Islam comes into this condition, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to definitely emphasize Tawheed, and call people against shirk, and also fanaticism and superstition. Arabia then was divided again like it was before Islam into tribes and Emirat, fighting with each other. Now, during the era when Ibn Abdul Wahhab started his da'wah, the majority of the people of Najd and the rest of the Muslim world had adopted the very methods that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa had forbidden. They learned these methods from their forefathers. The young among them were raised to think that this is the way to be a Muslim and how to practice the religion. And they were offended by the call of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and thought that his way belittled and demeaned their traditions and the ways they inherited from their forefathers. 
they were offended by the fact that Sheikh Ibn Abdul Wahhab exposed their practices as being polytheistic and acts of jahiliyyah. This was especially true among those who were perceived to be knowledgeable. Because by that time, if the majority of the people follow a, different, a, 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 a specific way, the scholars now, they don't want to defy the masses, so they went along with the people, allowed them to do these things without giving them da'wah that it is jahiliyyah. This was especially true among those who were perceived to be knowledgeable, who thought that if they followed the way of the sheikh, the status they earned and gained will be demolished and will diminish, would diminish. They were afraid that if they followed the sheikh's call, their people would question their sincerity and tell them that, how come you were silent all these years when we were doing all kinds of shirk and bid'ah, and now when this man came and reminded you about the Islam, now you're saying, yeah, his way is the true way. So they were afraid from both sides, on both sides, losing the gains and the leadership and being criticized by the people that they would tell you deceived us all these years. You didn't tell us about the truth. They feared that the commoners might think that the sheikh proved the leaders and teachers ignorant in the religion and deviant if they abandoned their practices and followed the way of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Some of their leaders and teachers actually believe, believed in those deviant ideas and practices. Whatever the cause, the call of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab faced stiff resistance from his contemporary scholar, so-called scholars who rejected the truth and used useless arguments to, uh, and defamation, defamation to, uh, as their tool to reject and attack the sheikh's methodology. Having failed to refute the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab using, using valid evidence or statements from aerial scholars, the deviant teachers and political leaders who felt threatened by the widespread acceptance of the call of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab <coughs> instead erected obstacles in the path, path of the da'wah by committing outright aggression against it and against its followers. Now, to go back to the question of the brother. So here's the Imam, he comes at a time when the people went back to the ways of Jahiliyyah and Shirk. He learned with the scholars of Hadith and Sunnah in his time that this is Shirk and this is Jahiliyyah. He went to Mecca, he went to Medina, never went to Dimashq or uh, Al Qahira or Egypt, but he went to Iraq, Basra, and came back to Najd with that knowledge and started the call to Tawheed when he got back. When he came back to his area, it was even more difficult on him after having gained knowledge to see all these practices widespread among his people. So he started calling them to Tawheed and to reform their practices and to go back to the Salah and the Zakah which was almost forgotten, nobody paid Zakah and to the other aspects of the religion and to go to the honorable way of doing things in our life with regards to our honor that the Sahaba and the, Islam, the Ummah of Islam did since the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the teachers now, they have a problem because their influence over the people was based on them agreeing with the people to what they did and not criticizing them. Here's a Sheikh comes who has vast knowledge. He learned the six books of Hadith, which usually means by heart, and then many other you know, books of Islam and he's well founded in the Aqeedah and he comes and argues with those scholars and offers, you know, Tawheed as compared to what they were offering people. And they wanted to put obstacles in his way. Slandering, calling him that he brought a fifth madhab or whatever it is that they were saying. Until the moment when they decided and, and uh, realized that they can't do anything against this Ta'wah until they start fighting. Therefore, they started telling the Bedouin uh, groups and nations around Dar'iyya, especially after he made the pact with Muhammad ibn, uh, ibn Saud, rahimahullah, to attack them and to take every opportunity to kill their members or to detain them, kidnap them. Uh, this reminds me very much with the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Soon after the Sahaba went to Medina, uh, before Badr, Muslims were weak. And they were, the Muslims were afraid that people will kidnap them and give them to Mecca, for example. They were not safe. And the Bedouins and, uh, and tribes of all of Arabia were against them. Ibn, uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, describes that as there was only one arrow and the whole Arabia was that arrow that was directed at Rasulullah and the Sahaba. Same thing here, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, 
found a leader in Muhammad ibn Saud who was willing and able to defend the da'wah. So Ibn Abdul Wahhab did not revolt against any state. He went to a place in Najd, Dir'iyya, that was ruled by a man whose name is Muhammad ibn Saud, and asked him for support, and he gave him that support. The Bedouins now and the tribes that rejected the message of Tawheed again, they thought that this is going to be very dangerous, because now he have an Amir of a state who's supporting him. So they directed their attacks at that Amir. Most of the early battles that happened were in defense of themselves. Then they started attacking these people in their areas, and they had every right to do that. Why? First of all, they're transferring and bringing back the message of Tawheed, and those were the barriers between them and reaching the people. Remember, among the goals of jihad, and why it starts, is that when there is a barrier between the Islamic message and a certain people because of authority or whatever it is, jihad now starts to remove that barrier. It's the same thing here. And many battles happened, uh, there were deaths on both sides. But Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab did not call for that or seek it. It happened because those people started attacking him and then they responded. One of the letters Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab sent, by the way, <coughs> it really touched me deeply because he said that when we came with this message, which is clear, it's the Quran, it's the Sunnah, it's Tawheed, this is Shirk, this is Bid'ah, we anticipated support from the Uthmani Khilafah being the leader of Muslims, you know, representative of Islamic State. But we were deeply touched because of their behavior that they called other people to come fight us. They fought us, they rejected us. And because of that, we suffered and they suffered. This is found here to tell you about the grief that Imam Muhammad al Wahhab had when people opposed him. So for the reformation movement that he came with, it wasn't a khawarij da'wah in any way. He didn't revolt against any ruler at all. And they didn't attack, attack the people around the Dir'iyya, for example, the state, that's the state capital of the Imara of Bani Saud. It was a small Imara in Najd. They didn't attack people to begin with, they attacked them. Then they went out of their area to remove the barriers between them and reaching the da'wah. Subhanallah. Just like what happened at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. When all of Arabia went back to kufr and shirk, or they reverted or they stopped praying, giving zakah, and Abu Bakr and Umar were having a discussion about that, and then Abu Bakr decided that we should fight these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the power and the patience to send army after army after army. If you read the history of the Hurub al ridda the, where people you know, reverted from the religion, so many armies went to so many towns and like Khalid ibn walid Amr ibn al-As would take the task of going through different towns, different tribes. They fought so many tribes with so few soldiers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. It reminds me of the same thing here because Muhammad ibn Saud, he soon died, rahimahullah. And here is a man who used to be before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab came to his, came to his town, just another tribal leader. leader didn't care much about what's going on or what his own people are practicing, shirk, tawheed, bid'ah. Also, his main concern was taxing the smaller tribes around his area. So when Muhammad al came and said, uh, do you, you know, give me the pledge to support the da'wah, among the things that Muhammad al mentioned, he said, what about the tax I used to collect from the tribes? Was going to, because that was, uh, you know, uh, important money. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you from the victories that Allah may give us if these people opposed us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. So they started, you know, expanding around their iya until they took almost all of uh, the Arabi uh, or the next section of Arabia. Muhammad ibn Saud died. His son came. Now Muhammad ibn Saud didn't learn much before that about the religion. You see that shortly after he met Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he became a scholar. This is the effect, the impact that Muhammad al Abdul Wahhab had on people. He would give them the enthusiasm to learn Tawheed, learn Sunnah. As soon as a tribal leader, literally a Bedouin, became a scholar. 
His son Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad bin Saud is even a bigger scholar than Muhammad. He was a major scholar during that time. And if you read the things that he was teaching and the eloquence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, you'll be amazed about the transformation. Abdul Aziz now, mashallah, ruled until the so-called Wahhabi movement took over Mecca and Medina. There is another story behind that, but the time, you know, uh, is short to talk about it. But <coughs> they entered Mecca and Medina after many, many, many uh, tricks and games and acts of betrayal happened uh, from the rulers of Mecca and Medina, and they, they had to enter it when uh, uh, the son of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Abdul Wahhab, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, had died by the time they entered Mecca and Medina when his son Abdul, when his son Abdullah came with the uh, army of Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud and they entered Mecca, he entered in the same way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered. Because we know from the history of the seerah that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Mecca to our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he entered it, he was riding his camel. <coughs> he didn't ride it with, the, uh, go through Mecca with the, his head held high. Like, yeah, I am back, I'm victorious. He was literally making sujood on top of the Jamal, so that he shows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, his appreciation and showing humbleness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the victory. So Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab did the same thing when he entered Mecca, so humble. And they protected the people of Mecca, respected them. But they did something that you might want to ask about because uh, we're talking here about the mission of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Someone asked me about the mission of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Was it to force everyone and to write the names of everyone and then see if they come to the Salah, otherwise they flog them? Uh, I'd say yes, but only in Mecca. Because in Mecca, where Al Kaaba is here, right in front of you, many people during that time did not make the Salah. Can you understand this? I mean, it's really huge. I can't understand it. But this is Al Kaaba. The Adhan, five days a day, uh, five times a day, they don't go to the Salah. They don't make Salah. So when Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab entered Mecca, realizing how people fall, fell, fell back to this miserable state, only in that area, what they did is that they gathered all the males who are required to be at the masjid, of course. Uh, you know, we should remember, the males should pray all five salawat at the masjid. So they got the, the males, took their names, and divided, you know, the people into groups where a few people will be taking care of every group. So you don't come for Fajr tomorrow, uh, you find a guest coming to your house, asking you, why didn't you come? Were you sick? Were you tired? You need help? Uh, no, I'm okay. I was just sitting here. Oh, tomorrow we have to see you at the masjid. If they didn't come the second day, the third day they will go take them from their home and flood them. Uh, why wouldn't they do that if it is around the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But this is not the way that they did in, uh, every way, everywhere else. So it was, it's, it's, their mission was to bring back the value of Islam and its practices in the life of Muslims. In some areas they were harsh. That's the question of the brother, you know. They are called harsh. Why is it that they were called harsh? It's because they called to Tawheed. You see, when someone has developed a way that's different than the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sahaba, and they got used to it, and you come and tell them, you know, your way is uh, not the way. In the best way you can. Uh, you've been living, you know, in a different way than the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People don't want to change their behavior or their life. And therefore, when you come and tell them about something, a mistake, shaitan tells them all the time that, ah, oh, this man thinks he's better than you. Or he tells them, look at their demeanor, they're, you know, harsh. What's harsh? What does harsh mean here? Musa alayhi salam, when he was in the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and received the Torah, he went back and found his people, you know, worshipping the cow. What did he do? He went after his brother Harun, who was the prophet from Allah, and took him by the hair on his head and the beard, and started pulling him by the hair. Until Harun, alayhi salam, said, Yabna um, 
oh son of my mother, he's also son of his father. But he mentioned the mother because it brings compassion and softness. Oh son of my mother, don't pull me by the hair on my head, on my beard, because I told these people, you know, not to do it, they almost killed me. So is this harsh? This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Today, if Musa alayhi salam were to come alive and do this to any of us, maybe, you know, people will call for the removal of the Imam and the change of the Prophet. We need another Prophet, we don't like this one. The Salafis these days, no matter what you say to people, they call you harsh. This is what they called Imam Ahmed, this is what they called Imam ibn Taymiyyah, this is what they called Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, just because you tell people the truth. And the truth means in their case to change their ways, their practices, their life. They don't want to do it, so they call you harsh. There's an experiment that I wanted to do, I forgot. I would go to someone that I wanted to tell them about something they're making, you know, mistaken, to show them, inshallah ta'ala, the best way I can that they made a mistake. Give them 20 pounds, 20 dollars. So, brother, this is a gift from me. And smile. Brother, mashallah, jazakallah khair, you come to the masjid. I just have a little thing, you know advice here, to, uh, I know you know about it, you know, your thob, uh, shorten it above the ankles. They will take the money and call you harsh. Why? Because it means that he has to go back home and do something. That's to the, his thob. So it is the way of those who reject the truth, who are stubborn, who don't want to change it to call people harsh. The fighting that happened between Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers and the people of Najd, was mainly in defense of the da'wah and the city. What happened after that was the expansion of the political state just like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did so that they can bring tawheed to other parts of Arabia. Abu Bakr could have received the same kind of accusation because so much bloodshed happened in Arabia during the battle of the battles of Ridda. More than, Allah knows best than what happened during the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. But Abu Bakr did it, he brought back the people back under the folds of the Islamic State. Muhammad al Abdul Wahhab started it. But let me give you one major reason why many people direct their attack at Muhammad al Abdul Wahhab. They oppose Ibn Taymiyyah and his Aqeedah, the four Imams and their Aqeedah. They oppose the Salafis of our time and the scholars of our time. But Muhammad al Abdul Wahhab, as compared to the, even the four Imams, may Allah give them his pleasure, uh, عنهم, Ibn Ibn Taymiyyah, he succeeded in establishing an Islamic state that followed the way of Tawheed and the practices of Sunnah. This kills them. Because as long as the Imam, like Ibn Taymiyyah, was oppressed by the state, he ended up dying in jail, you know, and Ibn Qayyim was released from jail after Ibn Taymiyyah died, uh, they were under the control of the state. Now they have the state. So now it is far more dangerous. This is why you know, these names and non slander came. Also, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab had an impression on every Islamic movement that appeared in the Muslim world since then. In India, an entire generation of scholars who together came and started emphasizing Tawheed and the Sunnah together so that they can oppose the British Empire who then was expanding little by little the European powers. The British in India supported the idea of say, calling these people Wahhabis and people who brought a fifth madhab. Why? Because Wahhabi would sound maybe strange. What's this Wahhabis? Another sect like Qadianis, like whatever, you know? And calling them that uh, uh, and uh, making them look like they brought a fifth madhab to reduce the value and the effectiveness of the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And therefore, when we find Muslims today repeating these accusations, we say this is incredible, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this da'wah success to reach almost every part of the world. This is why the scholars of Islam uh, have called the Imam the Mujaddid of Da'wah Tawheed, the one who brought it back and resurrected it. Who first used the term Wahhabi? Let's talk about this here. It appears that the British were among the first Westerners to take interest in calling this da'wah Wahhabism. And the ism in the end, I don't know what it means. Because they put ism after everything. Uh, I caution you brothers, you know, using what uh, these Westerners have, you know, called our places of worship. They called it mosque. It's not a mosque, it's a masjid. Please use the word masjid. This is what Allah called it. Mosque, we don't know where it came from. 
uh, whether it's Spanish for mosquito or French for whatever, we don't know who brought it, but mosque is not the name of, uh, you know, uh, the place of worship. Plus, plus uh, the language that we have is Arabic, is not Arabic. Bic is a pen, we know that. But Arabi is the language. The C at the end, what does it mean? They have to change the names. And sometimes translate the names into their language. So Wahhabism, <coughs> the reason being that the Dawa reached the most prized colony under British control, India. Many scholars in India embraced <coughs> and supported the Dawa of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Also the British witnessed the Dawa flourish as its followers included an impressive group of scholars throughout the Muslim world. During that time, Britain was also nurturing the Qadiani sect <coughs> to replace the mainstream Islamic ideas. They wanted to extend their control over India, relying on a sect of its own creation, the Qadianis, which was British created, British nurtured, and British protected, a sect that did not call for jihad against the British uh, colonialist of the of India or any part of the Islamic world. So when the Dawah of Imam Muhammad al Wahhab started spreading in India, and with it came the slogans of jihad against foreign occupiers, Britain became especially worried. They branded the Dawah and its supporters as Wahhabis to discourage Muslims in India from uh, joining it, in the hope that resistance to the British occupation of India would not intensify. Many scholars who supported the Dawah were captured, put in jail, and killed. So India had a major Sunnah revival movement that coincided with the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and after him, and he had a hand in making them enthusiastic because they heard about the victories of the Dawah in Arabia. And even some uh, secularist Arab authors like Taha Hussein, he was secularist, uh, to say the least. But when he spoke about the Da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he said, when it started, there came the hope in the Muslim and Arab world in specific that the early era of Islam will come back and that the Ummah will unite again and be mighty again. Even a secularist hoped that. <clears throat> it should be noted that in the letters and reports that he submitted to his stepfather and the Uthmanis, Ibrahim Pasha, adopted son of Muhammad Ali Pasha, who ruled Egypt, also used the terms Wahhabis, Khawarij, and Munafiqeen to call the, uh, the Da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the Saudi state. This of course occurred, occurred before Ibrahim Pasha rebelled against the Khilafah himself. I know, brothers, I really can't talk about this in one hour. So maybe I'll come back inshallah and sit here for 10 hours and read most of how, What can I do? So much information here. Now, they call the Muhammad Abdul Wahab as a Khawarij against the Uthmani state. Okay, Arabia wasn't under the rule of Uthmani state, and the eastern part of Arabia was under the Rashidi tribe, which was Rafidi, Rafida. So Muhammad Abdul Wahab gave us a service, he took that area from them, Allah khair, Muhammad bin Saud. But that area wasn't under the direct control of the Uthmani Khilafah. Also, <coughs> Uthmani Khilafah at that time was severely weak. They started calling the Uthmani Khilafah the sick man of Europe way before that. They started already. And it was severely under the protection and support and influence of Western powers, especially Britain, France, and Germany. Read the history. It was a very weak state. Because otherwise they could have sent their own army to attack Arabia. Why would they call Muhammad Ali Pasha in Egypt, help us send an army? Muhammad Ali Pasha was very uh, fascinated about the French, their tradition and their culture, and he wanted to bring it to Egypt. And I said he allowed the French Navy actually to come into the Red Sea and have patrols there. But what happened is that when they asked him to send the army, Muhammad Ali Pasha thought this was a good way for him to train his army and of course to take over more areas especially adding Mecca and Medina to his influence. So he sent his adopted son Ibrahim Pasha and Ibrahim Pasha suffered you know uh, defeats in the beginning then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a hikmah that he has allowed him to defeat the Islamic State uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and Muhammad ibn Saud started that was the first state and they did a lot of killing and destruction. The two armies, when they met, 
and they are described here. The so-called Wahhabi army did not have any music or drums, and they prayed on time. To the opposite of the Egyptian army who didn't pray, they brought khamr with them, and they had drums. And if some of them prayed, it wasn't like a general movement among them. Ibrahim Pasha is the same person now they call Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He revolted against the Uthmani Khilafah and did this and did that. So the Uthmani Khilafah brought Muhammad Ali Pasha from Egypt, who sent his son. They made, you know, war, destroyed the first Saudi state. Years after that, Muhammad Ali Pasha had a major dispute with the Uthmani Khilafah. So what did he do? He sent Ibrahim Pasha and quickly defeated the Uthmanis, almost went all the way to Istanbul. Almost, he went all the way to Istanbul. Almost <laughs> defeated and ended the Uthmani Khilafah. And he didn't stop, but after the uh, British and French Navy surrounded his army uh, in, a, in a city, Antakya, in the Mediterranean Sea. So now, you're calling Muhammad al Wahhab a khawarij against the Uthmani Khilafah. The Uthmani Khilafah sent Ibrahim uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha, who sent his son, adopted son. But these are the people who revolted. How come people don't criticize Muhammad Ali for that? But they single out Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Doesn't this tell you something, brothers? What he didn't do, he was, he was accused, accused of doing. It's Muhammad Ali and his son who did that. And those armies almost destroyed the Khilafah. But Britain had a game and a mission at that time. The she Britain wanted to start occupying the Muslim lands easily, without having major wars. For the Uthmani Khilafah to be under their influence, to exist and remain alive on life support, it was better for them than it divides, <coughs> because then they don't know who's going to be the ruler in which area. Let me give you an example, brothers, because you know that the British they had their armies and navies by then in the Mediterranean. They started going to Iraq and Basra. And this is way after Muhammad al Adil Wahhab left Basra, as we mentioned. And the British started, you know, uh, uh, connecting between their colonies in India and what they call the Middle East, so they can control all these areas practically. After World War I, what happened? Most of these areas fell under British occupation because they've been planning this for a very long time. And the Saudi and the Khilafah of Uthmaniyin by that time was extremely weak, uh, a dead state. Another thing that I want to say before, inshallah ta'ala, we try to finish soon. Remember that <coughs> in the last 50 years in the life of the Uthmani Khilafah, it came under the influence and direct control of a group of Jews who became Muslim for the purpose of reaching high ranks in government and the army. And these are called Jamiyat al-Ittihad wa taraqi later on. These are the ones who controlled the Khilafah, people who were truly Jews, who wanted to say things about the Uthmani Khilafah uh, to, ask, to control it, while at the same time the Uthmani remained among the Muslims that this is the Islamic State. Well, that, by that time the Khilafah was really weak and divided. Let's talk about one more issue, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before we finish. I translated here two of the letters on Aqeedah that Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wrote. I told you that he was a wise man. Of course, he followed the Hanbali Madhab in the major you know, principles, but he defied the Madhab in many ways when there is a hadith against what uh, the Hanbali Madhab says. But he didn't influence, I mean, make this as a major part of his mission. He wanted to concentrate on Tawheed, because Tawheed is bigger than following a Madhab. Now, I wanted to translate two letters the Imam wrote about Aqeedah. And I was thinking about this aspect. Most of the Sunni Muslims today, they follow the Han Hanafi Madhab. And Imam Muhammad al-Adul Wahhab is loathed and hated by many of those Hanafis, especially in the sub-Indian continent. I want to help them because I know they got wrong information and uh, the commoners don't have access to knowledge so they can read and compare and see what's right. You know, they've just they got rumors here yeah, and that's stuck there. So they hate the mission of Muhammad al-Adil Wahhab. They think he was a deviant. They call him Wahhabi, extremist, whatever it is they call them. So I wanted to choose two letters and compare them to Al-Aqeedah al tahawiyah 
العقيدة الطحاوية إمام الطحاوي is one of the major scholars of Islam of all time scholar of hadith, fiqh, Arabi, history and he was married to the daughter of Imam Al-Muzani who was the most famous student of Imam Al-Shafi'i in the beginning Al-Tahawi was a Shafi'i in the madhab then when he grew in knowledge he became a Hanafi in madhab and he collected a book he called the Aqidah according to the Imams and he mentioned Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani so Imam al-Tahawi wanted to collect a book for the generations to come especially since deviant sects appeared in his time and before his time he wanted to make clear to the people what Imam Abu Hanifa believed in he wrote Al-Aqidah al-Tahawiyya this is accepted by the four madhahib and the scholars of Sunnah as an authentic Aqidah except for a few parts and no Imam or Muslim after Rasulullah sallallahu is immune from error but that Aqidah it was called Al-Aqidah al-Mubarakah the blessed Aqidah and therefore I wanted to make comparisons between the Aqidah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and the Aqidah of the Hanafis in specific and I compared it to Al-Aqidah al-Tahawiyya and found that what Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab wrote about the Aqidah is almost word to word similar to what the Tahawi wrote and therefore we wanted to give this to the brothers who don't speak Arabic so that they can listen to the Imam talk about his Aqidah and judge for themselves what he Rahimahullah used to say it is really astounding and uh, to find that some western writers even called the movement of Muhammad al-Wahhab reformist that he wanted to bring back Tawheed and fight Shirk and that the political influence that the state had was mainly because of this message not that they wanted to start a state and then they thought oh let's call to Tawheed they called to Tawheed and Allah gave them success to find Muslim authors and even Imams you know give us grief about this Muhammad al-Adul Wahhab who is they know he was a deviant this and that but they can't read their own books let me end with uh, a little bit of a joke and then inshallah ta'ala will entertain your questions. Uh, there was a man who trained in an Islamic university to be an imam, a Muslim teacher, you know. He learned in an Islamic university. So once I was sitting uh, with him and then all of a sudden he said, I'm angry with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. I said, why? What's, what's the problem? He says, <coughs> because he gave the kingship to Abdul Aziz bin Saud. I said, wait a minute, there's a problem here. What Abdul Aziz you're talking about? Is it the father of the current king of Saudi? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, do you know that Muhammad al-Adul Wahhab died, you know, decades before Abdul Aziz was even born? So how, how can he give him the kingship? Okay? Maybe he came after death and told him, you know, take it and uh, you're the ruler after me. What does this indicate? If someone who goes to university for four years, having access to books, been taught by the shiuch how to read Islamic books and get evidence from it, can get this wrong or become this wrong about the imam, then most of what you have heard, brothers and sisters, is similar to that. Rumors, false accusations and things that cannot be supported, like the claim that he met with the uh, British council and became a British spy, uh, we can do this to our scholars and imams. Of course, he made mistakes. During his time, by the way, <coughs> many battles happened. And those who joined the armies of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Muhammad ibn Saud, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, they were Bedouins who just, you know, didn't have much time to learn about the Islamic man. They were harsh. Some of them were harsh and made killing more than they should. But didn't Khalid ibn Walid, radiyallahu an, the sword of Allah, once kill an entire tribe. And Rasulullah raised his hand and said, Oh Allah, I disown the action of Khalid. Three times. Did Rasulullah remove him from the leadership? No. Did Abu Bakr remove him? No. Did Umar remove him? Yes. You know for what? Because he thought that Khalid was getting arrogant. But Khalid, when he died, they went to his house and found nothing in his house except a mat and the horse that he used to ride for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even Umar radiallahu anh said we misjudged Khalid so Khalid was harsh in some of his battles but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know uh, these are humans based on the fact that these people who joined Muhammad al-Wahhab were Bedouins 
they had harshness in them. Three more minutes, I just want to finish, inshallah. They attacked Karbala. They attacked, attacked Karbala, the uh, army of Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Saud. In the middle of the day, and killed most of its males and took others captives. What is Karbala? Karbun wa Bala. Karbala is the name of the city. Karb, grief, Bala, disaster. This is where Al Hussein is claimed to have died, and he died there. And this is where one of his two heads was buried. Because he had two heads. One of them is in Cairo, the other one is in Istanbul. And I can assure you, none of them is his head. They all claim they have the head. The head. He died there. Now, the city of Karbala during that time had turned into Rafidi completely. And the Rafida, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab was shocked to see the practices of the Rafida in Basra. And we saw them today, many of you who didn't grow up in areas like I did in Kuwait that had a lot of Shia. Many of you now see that. Time magazine once took a picture of those people who a hundred yards or meters before the monument that's built on a grave of uh, one of their imams, they fall to the ground and start swimming in dust. They can't walk there, they have to swim until they go, get there to the door so they can invoke the dead. About that stuff that they do to themselves, you know, that is so terrible that they use, you know, uh, knives and swords and they cut themselves and their children. And they, on Time Magazine, another issue, they put the picture of an, uh, an old, uh, a man who had like a four or five year old son and he hit him with a sword. They never called this, you know, this is abuse of children. I heard, and the brother is here to confirm, that actually the government here allows him to do this here and, uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, behind doors, closed doors. Just don't show it to the public. But you have to have medical, you know, assistance nearby. <laughs> Muhammad al Adul Wahhab, when he saw all these things, he was shocked. Definitely he transferred the knowledge about al Rafid and what they do to his students. So the army that attacked Karbala, it was harsh. And I admit that, I admit it here, because we're followers of the truth. We're not, uh, you know, uh, blind uh, followers of anyone, regardless of who he is. We follow the truth. But let's talk about what the Shia did during that time, over from the Shirk, and Kufr, and Rafid, and how they, until today, they do it, they curse the Sahaba. Uh, look at the Houthis now, what they're doing. Those Houthis have become Ja'fari in the past few decades, little by little. They've left the Zaydi Madhab, which we are told by the scholars of before that it is the closest Rafidi or Shia Madhab to the Sunnah. But now they're different. Over the centuries, they became more and more fanatical against the Sahaba. So these people, the Houthis, they have the almost every uh, idea or practice that the Ja'fari Madhab has. Quran was changed and corrupted, so it's not pure. Sunnah doesn't exist. The Sahaba became Kuffar, Aisha committed Zina. And then they go to the area in Yemen where the Salafis have, you know, their mashallah compound and you know, have the school. I'm not really familiar with their teacher at all, but I heard that the scholars have called for support for them, including Sheikh Rabi' Hafizahullah and other scholars. Uh, they know him better than me, but anyway, they surround them. They don't allow food or medicine to go into that area. <clears throat> I'm telling you, if you capture their leaders, they might tell you this is in retaliation for what happened in Karbala. Because they did that before. They said that things that they did against the Sunnis, we are going to retaliate for what happened in Karbala. There was harshness in there. But again, these were Bedouins who were by nature tough didn't have the time to learn the Islamic manners in the best way, but they attacked the city of Kufr and Shirk. So we need brothers to go back and now understand <coughs> what this Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab was about. A reformer. All what he wanted to do is bring back Tawheed to our life. Unite the Muslim Ummah under one leadership. Bring back the Sunnah in our lives so they can, we can practice it. And succeeded. And because of the barakah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought with him, maybe the oil they discovered it today out of a barakah because of he, him coming to that area. Allah knows best. Until today, the area where he, you know, spread his da'wah 
and his children until the day, today they are called the Al Sheikh, the family of a Sheikh, a Sheikh meaning he Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, the Mufti, the uh, Minister of Awqaf. They're both Al Salih Al Sheikh. Al Sheikh means the family of the Sheikh, which Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. This is how respected he is until today. That area, as compared to most other Muslim areas, they don't see monuments being worshipped, the people going around graves seven times like they do around the Kaaba, or they invoke the dead in public, or they practice acts of shirk in public, because the state now is dedicated to preventing those things from happening. Of course there are mistakes, there are shortcomings, but think about the bigger picture. What happened before Muhammad al Hab started his da'wah, it could have remained until today. And therefore you go to Mecca or Medina today, you see thousands of monuments and things that unbelievable. The people go, I was in uh, the graveyard of the Sahaba, al baqiq and then I heard noise, people screaming and shouting. I said, what's going on? Some people, Shia came to a big grave that they claim Al-Abbas was buried in it and they have the rumors Abbas was so big. That this is why the graves. But there were a few Sahaba maybe buried, uh, I mean buried there, or a few dead people buried in the same grave, and they started screaming, shouting, crying, saying poems. And the guy who was saying poems, he said like, uh, uh, there is a famous uh, poem that they said that uh, uh, a, a bird was walking close to a you know a water source, and all of a sudden the bird said a poem of a hundred sentences in praise of Al-Hasan Al-Hussein. So they repeat that, they say the bird started it. Uh, it's not, you know, an amazing thing because for Asfur, by the way, you know how Asfur was called Asfur? You know what Asfur is? Asfur is a bird. Every bird in Arabic you call it Asfur. Then we call it the species, but everything that flies we call Asfur. He said Asfur was a creature, his name was Fur. That's what the Shia say. His name was Fur. He was called to submit to the Imamah of Al Hussein and Ali, and he refused, so his name became Asa Fur Asfur. <laughs> Fur disobeyed. And one of them, I was listening to him, and he said, I was watching an ant going up the wall and falling, up the wall and falling. Then I said to the ant, Say, Ya Ali. <laughs> He's not going to fall. And he claimed that it said and it did go up all the way. I'm sure this guy, I don't know what kind of uh, drink he takes, but this is really hilarious. So brothers, when you look at their practices and what they do, it is amazing. Therefore, when those Bedouins who have learned Tawheed now again, MashaAllah, are very enthusiastic about it, they go to people who worship the dead in this manner. They were harsh in the Karbala. But inshaAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you read about the general way that Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab and his people conducted the warfare, it was humane, it was necessary, and what they did is to bring back Tawheed to us, inshaAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to apologize, but I know that some students of knowledge came here today to listen to some specific things, but I really can't. It's difficult. Here is a 700 page book that took me 10 years of my, uh, 10 months of my life to collect. So much information here, it is amazing how much goodness I found in this da'wah. And I encourage you brothers, inshallah, this book is out of print, but soon inshallah ta'ala will reprint it. Buy the book, and bi Allah azza wa jal, you will learn so much about this Imam to be like this man. I'm sure, I, I know, I just one, one more thing, because uh, in Connecticut we had a center close to us that big, mashallah. And was uh, always, you know, mashallah, most of the <coughs> population, I mean, the people who go there from Indian subcontinent, Pakistan and India. And I know that they have a lot of rumors that they heard about the Imam. So I brought this book and we spoke to some brothers, said, you know, buy boxes of books so we can give them away for free. I don't want, them, I don't want to sell it. I'm not a merchant. So we went there and had a couple of hundred books distributed. I saw a man older than me, I'm 50, uh, he's at least 60. And he was the principal of the school. He was looking at the book, then looking away and looking at the book. So I came near him and said, what's going on, brother? He said, all my life I've been hearing bad things about this man. I said, this is your chance now to learn the good things about him. And the bad things you heard mainly came from Kuffar. 
don't allow the kuffar to tell you who's a good Muslim and who's a bad Muslim. You do it yourself. He read it and came back and said, he's an imam. Definitely. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us knowledge in the religion, make us among the righteous. If you have any questions, inshallah. Yes. Uh, Riyadh didn't exist then. Um, specifically, you know, remember which uh... Yeah, yeah, some areas, Jakallah khair, this is a good reminder. Um, I haven't read my own books in a couple of years, so I don't remember everything here. But Jakallah khair for the reminder. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was reading the salah, and he made mistake in the recitation in the book that came to him. And then he said afterwards, was uh, Ubay here? He said, yeah, I am here. Why didn't you correct me? <laughs> so this is a, a good reminder, Zakallah khair. One of the areas surrounding, uh, close to the Ri'iyah, it took Muhammad ibn Saud and his successors 10 years to control that area. This is how patient they were. They could have attacked it, and did to it what they did to Karbala later on, but it took them 10 years negotiations, telling these people, you know, come to us, we're going to call you to Quran and Sunnah. Uh, Subhanallah, 10 years until they attacked it, but then when they attacked it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them control over it. The bloodshed that people think happened during that time, in my view, it was minimal, because you have hundreds and hundreds of tribes, and the warfare against him and his da'wah was so tremendous that it was unbelievable. But when you look at the number of dead, it wasn't really that much. There are historians he wrote about who wrote about those battles. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find some of them here, some of the incidents and history about those battles. Uh, one thing that, you know, of course, when they said that, they said the army of the believers and the army of the mushrikeen. So there was a little bit of uh, harshness here. But it was clear, those who come support Tawheed, they should be called the army of the believers, insha'Allah. And those who supported Shirk and wanted to keep the status as it is of the Ummah, which is backward, ignorant, and deviant, and on a way of Shirk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad sallallahu to destroy, they should be called in some fashion the Mushrikun. The first written question, inshallah, to the Shaykh. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, can you please clarify the hadith about the horns of the devil rising from Najd? Is this Abdul Wahab? The devil, his name was Iblis. It wasn't Muhammad al Abdul Wahab. That's to begin with. Yes, inshallah, we can talk about this. I mean, because it's, it's funny how some people would use this against the da'wah of Muhammad al Abdul Wahab. We said it's a reformist movement. What did he call people to? Did he call people to drinking, to taking the ahkam from the Torah, to do shirk, to abandon salah, siyam, don't pay zakah? What he called the people to is tawheed, to abandon shirk, to follow the sunnah, and to practice the pillars of Islam. And therefore, his da'wah should tell you about him without calling, you know, or uh, hearing what the people say about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab being from Najd, and Najd is where shaitan, the horn of shaitan come. Let's talk about this, insha'Allah. Okay, here I'm going to read from uh, the laptop, the same book. Wahhabiya appeared in Najd, land of turmoil, where the devil's horns appear. Enemies of the da'wah, enemies of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahhab often mention this hadith as clear proof they claim to the deviant nature of this da'wah and its followers. What's the hadith? Al-Bukhari narrated his, this hadith from Abdullah ibn Umar. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم بارك لنا في شامنا وفي يمننا Oh Allah give us blessing and barakah in our Sham and our Yemen. By the way that during that time Sham and Yemen were not part of the Islamic State. But he was telling this is a mu'jiza, huh? He was telling them Sham, Yemen meaning you're going to be controlling those areas. Oh Allah give us barakah in those areas. It's uh, one of the prophecies of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, what about our Najd? 
He said, Allahumma barik lana fi shamina wa fi yamanina. Again, qalu wa fi najdina, qal hunaka zalazilu wal fitan wa biha yatlu qarnu shaytan. Oh Allah, bless our Sham, which is Syria and Jordan and Lebanon and Palestine and our Yemen. The people said, what about our Najd? The Prophet said again, Oh Allah, bless our Sham and our Yemen. They again said, our Najd as well. The Prophet said, there will appear earthquakes and afflictions. There will appear, meaning uh, Najd, earthquakes and afflictions. And from there will come out the side of the head or horn of the sh of shaitan. It is sufficient to refute this false claim by simply reporting another hadith found in Sahih Muslim and collected from the same companion, Abdullah ibn Umar. Now listen, they say, Najd, Shaitan, Horn, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. But Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab called to the opposite of what Shaitan, you know, wants. Imam Muslim reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi that he said that Shaitan has given up hope that the believers in Arabia will obey him and worship him. <laughs> Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab called for disobeying shaitan and disbelieving in him. So they can't be together. But look, look at this sufficient, inshallah, refutation. Muslim narrated that Salim, son of Abdullah ibn Umar said, O oh, people of Iraq, how strange it is that you ask about minor sins but commit major sins. I heard my father, Abdullah ibn Umar, narrate that he heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, while pointing his hand towards the east. Najd in Arabic means east. Remember, Najd is not only an area, it's also a direction. So Najd means east. إِنَّ الْفِتْنَةَ تَجِيءُ مِنْهَا هُنَا إِنَّ الْفِتْنَةَ تَجِيءُ مِنْهَا هُنَا مِنْ حَيْثُ يَطْلُعُ قَرْنَا الشَّيْطَانِ The turmoil will come from this side, the east, from where appear the two horns of shaitan. Imam al-Khattabi said, Najd pertains to areas lying to the east. Thus, the Iraqi desert and surrounding areas is the Najd of Medina. So he was talking about what? About Muhammad al-Adul Wahab and Najd of today? No, he was talking about the direction of the east. He pointed to the direction of the east and said this is where the shaitan's horn will come from. Salim, son of Abdullah ibn Umar, was criticizing the people of Iraq. Thus they come and ask the scholars of Mecca, what about killing a mosquito in the haram? Would that nullify my hajj? You killed al Hussein, and you're asking us about mosquitoes? So he's saying, O oh people of Iraq, listen, O oh people of Iraq, how strange it is that you ask about minor sins but commit major sins. I heard my father say that Rasulullah Sallallahu said, while pointing to the east, to the Najd of Medina, this is where the fitna will come from. So Salim understood from the hadith that the area is which area? Iraq. Say it loudly. Iraq. Now Imam al-Khattabi said, Najd pertains to areas lying to the east. Thus, the, the Iraqi desert and surrounding areas is, areas is the Najd of those who reside in Medina because it is to the east, northeast actually of Medina. Also, Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and al dawudi issued statements regarding Iraq, Iraq being the location of the Najd mentioned in these ahadith. So then, I mean, what else is there to say? O people of Iraq, you ask about minor sins, but you commit major sins. So the hadith is talking about Iraq. Now, throughout history, you tell me about, if you read a little bit about Islamic history, where did the fitan come from? One after another, after another, after, until today. Where? Iraq. Did you hear in the history of Islam, fitna after fitna coming from Najd? Uh, in a short period of time, they went back to the ways of shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah. He brought him back to Tawheed bi Allah azza wa jal. There is no major fitna, but Iraq. Now Al-Hajjaj, he goes to Iraq. And he learns from the ways of the people of Iraq, fitna and rebellion. What did they do? Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu an, moved the Khilafah from Medina to Al-Kufa because he thought he's going to be among his supporters. 
they wouldn't support him. Every time he wanted to do something, they would fail him, betray him, argue with him until he said, I wished for death to come to me so that I can leave you. You just betrayed me, did everything wrong against what I want to do. They called Al Hussein after the death of Ali radiallahu an. They called Al Hussein to come to Al Iraq and told him, We'll support you. Some of the people who knew the people of Iraq said to him, Don't go to Iraq. They failed your father, they failed your brother, and their hearts are with you, meaning they pretend to be like this, but their swords are against you. And they killed him. Among the major books of Shia today, they admit that it was the Shia who killed Al Hussein. It's not us, it's the Shia. Go back to their history, you find that the soldiers who killed Al Hussein were from the same Shia who told him, Come here, will you come here, we'll announce you the Khalifa, will support you. Subhanallah. Until today, you find some other aspects, brothers, that you should remember. Until today, this fitna is happening. Just yesterday, somebody asked me, how come those Sunni Muslims don't commemorate the death of Hussein? Death of Hussein, because uh, Ashura comes every year. Why don't the Sunnis mention that? By the way, Al Hussein died during this day. So I said to him, "Those who are bigger in the religion than Al Hussein died. We don't commemorate their death. Starting with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Bakr, Umar was murdered by a Christian Persian." Uh, some scholars said he wasn't Majusi, he was a Persian. Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, it was a title. He killed Umar. And Uthman radiallahu anh was killed by Arab Muslims. What a shame. That, but we don't come every year and say this day Uthman was killed because their religion is a religion of grief, you know, death and uh, crying, you know. Find something better to do, you know, some, someday you're happy. And they would sit and memorize, uh, remember, you know, Al Hussein, everything. The fitna came from Iraq all the way until today. Throughout the history, you saw so many states that rose and was were destroyed, and many of them were Rafida, Sunni, Rafida, too much fitna, death and destruction in Iraq, but not in Najd. So two things. The Sahabi who narrated the hadith about Najd, his own son said it's about Iraq. And historically, the area of Najd didn't have nearly a fraction of the fitna that Iraq had, so the hadith is about Iraq. Uh, is it true that Abdul Wahab was responsible for destroying the graves, including the graves of the Sahaba? Abdul Wahab was somewhat opposed to the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. So I think you're asking about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab destroying the graves, meaning by taking the dead out and, you know, well, I don't, this is a joke. Every time I went to a masjid in <laughs> Texas, this guy came and followed me. Wherever I am there, he comes and says, the first time I didn't know him, anyone has a question? He raises his hand. I said, okay, alhamdulillah. He took a 15-page question from his, page, from his uh, pocket. <laughs> 15 pages. Started reading, reading, reading. reading. What's happening, Akhi? Is this one? Co yeah, this all is one question. <laughs> Fifteen pages. I mean, you're not gonna read the whole thing. I don't have time for that. You know. <laughs> then he started shouting at me. I think it's stuck here. Started shouting at me. He said, "Those Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia, they're taking the bones of the Sahaba out of the graves and conducting DNA tests on them." What are you talking about? I mean, the the topic wasn't even that. I said, "How do you know they're the Sahaba?" I said, what? I said, did you conduct DNA test and you, you found out they are a Sahaba? Muhammad al-Adul Wahab did not destroy the graves of the Sahaba. How did he do that? Monuments on graves is something else. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent the Sahaba, including Abu Sufyan and Ali ibn Abi Talib, to go to where graves are built up to demolish them. So if he did it, Jazakallah khair. But how do you know it's a Sahaba? Monuments in the grave, how do you know it's a Sahaba? Uh, this is ridiculous, brothers. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, Jazakallah khair, uh, who asked the question, but this is the answer. Uh, prove it. What can I say? Prove it. Why would they take, I mean, of all the graves in Arabia, there are only graves of the Sahaba. Uh, millions of people died before and after. So how do you know they're the graves of Sahaba? No. They destroyed monuments on graves. May Allah reward them for that.
This is a good tawheed that they brought back to the ummah. A brother asked the question that what is the correct opinion for naming yourself with the names such as uh, Ikhwan, Ikhwani, Jumaat Tabligh, uh, Salafi, so and so on. Zakallah khair akhir, may Allah reward you. That's a good question. Um, Imam ibn Taymiyyah said, no one should be criticized for ascribing himself to a Salaf al-Salih by calling them, them themselves Salafi. So the question that I would ask everyone here, who are a Salaf al-Salih? Help me here. Help me. Sahaba, Tabi'een, Tabi'i Tabi'een, led by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So these are a Salaf al-Salih. According to the authentic mutawatir hadith, Mutawat is the highest grade of authentic hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu said, Khayrun nas, the best people, Qarni, are my generation, Thumma alladheena yununahum, then the generation after that, Thumma alladheena yununahum, then the generation after that. So when we say, I'm a Salafi, I'm ascribing myself to that generation. I'm saying to you, this is what I want to follow. Their way, their manhaj, their understanding, practices. I couldn't be criticized for that because I'm not ascribing myself to a sheikh who started a hizb or a group. I'm ascribing myself to the best of all Muslims of all time because when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is with them, they outweigh any ummah that came before. So we're saying we follow the way of a Salaf al-Salih. Now those who call themselves Tabligh, Ikhwan, ask them because I haven't called myself a Salafi. I'm ascribing myself to the way of Salaf al-Salih and the way to do it in Arabic is to say Salafi, the yeah here says, this is my manhaj, my way. By the way, who's the first to use the word Salaf of all the Muslims? Can you tell me? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, Once Fatima came, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked for Fatima to come. She came, Aisha said she was walking the same way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walked. <laughs> she, she you know, looked uh, a lot like the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walked. And Rasulullah gave her some news or something, uh, told her something, she cried. Then he told her something and she left. Now Aisha said, what did Rasulullah tell you? She said, I'm not going to convey <laughs> the secret of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha was so jealous, you know. I, went, I, I have to know what he told you. I can't tell you. After he died, she goes to Fatima and tell her, now he died. <laughs> so give me what, tell me what he told you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed to, uh, to Fatima this news that every year Jibril used to come to me to review the Quran once during the month. Now this year he came twice. And I think this is because my time on this earth has come to an end. She cried. Then he told her, uh, you will be the first from among my family to follow me, to die. And she left. But in between he said, to her, you know, don't cry. He wanted to give her some kind words, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, you know, don't cry because to you, I am the best Salaf, Bukhari and Muslim. So who used the word first? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He is our, then you're a Salafi. He is your Salaf, then you're a Salafi. Salaf means ancestor and the scholars of Islam always mention this term, as salaf al-salih, as salaf al-salih, as salaf al-salih. Look in the books of the Imams of Islam. So today, all what I'm telling you, brother, I follow the way of salaf al-salih. But when you're looking at me saying this, think of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Fatima and Aisha and how they conducted the religion. Don't look at me and say, this man claims that he is the righteous one, he's going to Jannah, we're going to Jahannam. Because I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about the methodology you should follow. But my mistakes, of course I make mistakes. I hope to rise up to that level. And the Salafis who are here, and everybody should be a Salafi, you ascribe yourself to a Salaf al-Salih. Don't think that because you're in it, you are saved. You have to behave yourself the way Rasulullah Sallallahu conducted himself in the religion. If Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practiced the akhlaq and Islamic manners, then we should. Uh, aqidah alone is not sufficient. You have to have aqidah and action. Why? The scholars of Islam, including aqidah tahawiyah, inshallah ta'ala, they agree. Uh, aqidah tahawiyah had a problem there, but bi'idhna Allah azza wa jal, inshallah, when we explain it, inshallah, you'll understand what happened. That our religion is faith, 
statement and action. So the faith is the aqidah, statement is the words, and action, you behave yourself according to the Islamic manners. Do you understand, brothers, that the difference? The other groups, you ask them, they call the name after a sheikh, after a way, a Sufi, this is whatever. We don't care. We ascribe ourselves to a Salaf al-Salih. And they shouldn't criticize us for calling ourselves Salafis, but we should criticize them for calling themselves whatever it is they call themselves. Because they invented those names. Those names. Question Is it true that the Hadith believed that Prophet was an ordinary man like we are? Say, O Muhammad, I am a human just like you. Halas, I'm done. You need any more? Halas, you use it, inshallah. Question from the floor. Yes, uh, you know the Uthmani Khilafah, did they rule the Ottoman Empire and was that dismantled by Sheikh Abdullah Wahab? Uh, I'm not sure. The Uthmani Khilafah is the... Is the well, Were they the Ottoman Empire at the time? Yeah, they are the Ottoman Empire, yeah. They, because the Westerners, they corrupt the names. So Uthman became Ottoman. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, and Arabic became Arabic, Masjid became mosque, and who knows what they're going to come up with. Uh, some scholars said that uh, they do this on purpose, because when it gets to their tradition, they keep preserve their names. But when it comes to the names of things or aspects from other religions or people, they actually translate that. And you find that, uh, for example, Jesus, the J here is uh, typical of the Greek language. And they don't pronounce it, so it's Isas, you know, Jesus. The Spanish, they call it, call him Jesus. The Arabic people call, call him Yesu'. Isa Yesu'. They just move the, <laughs> the letters back and forth to come up with a name that nobody called him before. But they have a sickness in doing that. Therefore, Jazakallah khair. Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire is the Uthmani Khilafah, the same one. I'm a written question here. It says that, is it true that current rulers of Saudi Arabia are slowly destroying Islamic history. Um, no, it's not true. What, what, what are they doing? I, I need examples. What are they doing? Don't tell me they're moving the bones of the Sahaba. <laughs> We're done with that. So the houses that people, uh, Sahaba used to live in, uh, this, these houses you can't say about any house in all of Arabia that this belonged to the Sahaba or that Sahaba because the centuries passed and Mecca went through destruction of houses and rebuilding and Kaaba itself was rebuilt three times. You know that? One during the time of Rasulullah before he became a prophet and two times after that including during the time of Zubair, Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an. So destroying houses of people, we don't revere houses, we don't revere relics of people, uh, they don't mean anything. So maybe people before Islam, they had, you know, they would have girlfriends from this tribe who was residing in this area. Then they move, go after, take the cattle to go somewhere else where there is water and, and grass for their cattle. They would come by and start crying. I kiss that wall, I kiss that wall and that wall because she's not there anymore. Alhamdulillah, in uh, Islam we don't have this. So, you live in a house for 20 years, it's just a building, Habibi. Move and khalas, don't look back. So, they destroy the Islamic history. I doubt they're doing Akhib. Brothers, uh, always ask for the proof. You know, just proof. They say something, what's the proof? I'm not the defender of uh, the rulers in Saudi Arabia. They can defend themselves. But if you want to say anything about it, just give me the proof. Because I, I can't really answer this question because I don't know what is it that they're destroying. Uh, any questions from the floor? Take another random question. It says that um, some people say that Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab was responsible for killing over 12,000 ulama. Is this true? If Arabia had 12,000 ulama during that time, it must be a magnificent place to live in. 12,000 scholars in Arabia? Uh, no, this is again, give me the proof. 
And what ulama that are they talking about? So he collected 12,000 ulama from Najd. And then maybe the same person who started this rumor would say, Najd is the area of Fitan, but it had 12,000 scholars. And Ibn Abdul Wahab killed them. There is no proof to that. It's only false, fabricated rumors. No proof to that. And I can assure you, Arabia didn't have that many scholars. And Ibn Abdul Wahab did not kill a single scholar who called to Tawheed. I challenged everyone to come and bring a single name that he killed a scholar. Or even from the shiuch who opposed him, he was kind to them. He was always writing to them, advising them, reminding them. And many times he would be patient more than he should have with them being patient and calling them. But 12,000 scholars in Arabia, uh, in Najd, this is, uh, what can I say, ridiculous. Wallah. Just one quick, uh, this book is about the pillars of Iman and pillars of Islam and how Allah preserved the Quran and Sunnah from corruption. Uh, this one is a response to the attack by the Pope on our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentioned 50 different doubts that or things that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. Compare that to the Old Testament and New Testament. We have a website, islamlife.com. We have thousands of articles there, many booklets, especially debating Christians who attack the religion and Jews. Uh, on the website, you can take them for free, booklets for free. Also, we have debates on uh, YouTube. Uh, we have, you know, with the uh, evangelicals. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us knowledge in the religion, make us among the righteous. And the dua to save when we finish audiences and classes. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu